What's up everyone, I'm Vincent and today I want to take a look at a few integration by parts problems. So these are the four examples we're going to go through, here are some notes and let's get started. Okay, for this first question here, we're going to use the integration by parts formula. And just know that we use integration by parts when u substitution is not an option. And this formula is kind of like the product rule but for integrals. And the way this formula works is the first thing we have to do is define u and dv from the original integral. And the order we choose u in could be remembered with this mnemonic, liate. So the first term we would choose for u would be a log function. And notice we have an algebraic function and we have a log function. So our u term here would be equal to natural log x. But then we also have to define dv. And dv is essentially just the leftovers, x dx. Now from here, we're going to calculate du. So we have du is equal to 1 over x dx. And v would be the antiderivative of dv. And the antiderivative of x is 1 half x squared. So once we complete step 1, so this is now finished, then to go to step 2, we're going to calculate, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we already did step 2. Now we could apply the formula. So then the integral is now equal to u times v. So we're going to multiply u times v, and we're going to have 1 half x squared, natural log x, and now we have minus the integral of v times du. So v du is the product of these two terms here. So when we multiply these two, we're going to have 1 half, and that 1 half we could just write outside of the integral as a coefficient. And we have 1 over x times x squared is just, is just x. And now we tack on the dx term here. So then our final result, we're just going to rewrite the 1 half x squared natural log x. And the antiderivative of x is x to the second divided by 2. So we'll have minus 1 half times 1 half x squared, which will give us minus a fourth x squared. And then we just tack on this plus c. And if you want to check your answer to this question, you could just go ahead and take the derivative of our antiderivative here. And it should bring us right back to the beginning. But this is our final answer to the first question. Okay, now this is the second type of question that we have to deal with. And for this particular question, we go through the same steps. We're going to define u and dv. And the order that we choose them is we do exponential functions last and trig functions second to last. So here, we would go with the trig function u is equal to sine of 2 theta. And then dv would be equal to e to the theta. So then in the next line, when we calculate du, we're going to get cosine 2 theta d theta, but don't forget to use chain rule. The derivative of 2 theta is 2. And then v, the antiderivative of e to the theta, is e to the theta. But notice, uh, pay very close attention to what happens here. So we defined u, we calculate du and v, now we're going to use the formula. So when we use the formula, u times v, we're going to have this integral here is equal to e to the theta times sine 2 theta minus, and now look at the coefficients we have. We have 2 times the integral of e to the theta times cosine 2 theta d theta. And once again, we have another problem. This is an integral that we cannot just quickly evaluate. So what we're going to have to do here is apply integration by parts again. We have to repeat this until we are done. So if we look, now I'm going to index this. I'm going to call this u1, dv1, v1, and then du2. Because for the next part here, to handle this new integral, our new u term is going to be we're going to have u2 is equal to, and now we're going to define it as cosine 2 theta. And then we're going to have dv, but we're going to put a subscript here of 2, is equal to the leftovers in this integral, which is going to be e to the theta d theta. Okay. Uh, notice up here is a little bit sloppy, but I should have a d theta attached. Yeah, little notation like that is definitely important, so... Um, you know, make sure we write everything correctly here. 
So now the derivative of cosine two theta is gonna be negative sine two theta d theta, and I leave a space because we have to do the chain rule. The derivative of two theta is still two. And now v2 is just equal to e to the theta. So now for this line, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna rewrite the question, okay? The original integral was e to the theta sine two theta and then d theta. And so far, this is equal to e to the theta sine two theta minus two times, and then this is where we're gonna leave the space. Okay, because notice here, minus two times, and all this stuff in red was to help us evaluate this particular integral here. So this part here is where we're applying integration by parts again. So now we use the formula. This integral here is equal to, and we have u times v, so now we're multiplying e to the theta times cosine 2 theta. And now we have minus the integral of v du. So we're going to multiply v times du. That's these two terms here. So notice we have minus, and now we have a negative 2 attached to sine 2 theta d theta. So that negative 2 is a constant that could come out in front of the integral. So if we bring it in front of the integral, this is going to come out as a plus 2 now. So instead of minus negative 2, I could change this to plus 2. And we have e to the theta, and then we have sine 2 theta d theta. I'm just going to make a little bit of space here because this is quite a bit to write. And then I'll reclose that bracket. Okay, so we have e to the theta times sine 2 theta d theta. And we will close this bracket. And once you get to this step here, it doesn't seem like we accomplished much. But if we distribute this negative 2 now, we're going to have e to the theta sine 2 theta minus 2e to the theta cosine 2 theta minus 4 times the integral of e to the theta sine 2 theta d theta. Okay, and on the left side here, I'm going to just rewrite what we have. It seems like we just went full circle because notice now we're back at e to the theta sine 2 theta d theta. However, in order for us to solve this, we're going to add this integral to the other side because these are like terms. These are matching integrals. So we can combine them. So this is like algebra specifically for calculus. Okay, we're going to add this. And I don't have to write this in front, but there's an invisible one in front. So you could see that we're just adding the coefficients of each integral. So here, this term cancels, all right? We're going to have a plus c attached at the end. Now we could throw this plus c in, and we'll say our plus c is here, which is for the sake of space. But now we have 5 times the integral of e to the theta sine 2 theta d theta is equal to, and we have e to the theta sine 2 theta minus 2e to the theta cosine 2 theta plus c. And now we just have to multiply everything by 1 fifth. So we're going to just multiply everything in this equation by 1 fifth, which gives us our final answer, e to the theta sine 2 theta d theta is equal to 1 fifth e to the theta sine 2 theta minus 2 fifths e to the theta cosine 2 theta, and then plus c. Now, technically, you might say, like, oh, why don't I have a 1 fifth c attached at the end? If you want, if that bothers you, what you could do is you could name this first c, you could call it c1, like this, put a subscript of 1, and then we could say 1 fifth c1 is equal to c. So just so that there's, like, no confusion here, because um, a constant multiplied by another constant is a constant, but... Most of the time, we just ignore that little bit of algebra, but here, 
we'll write it. So this is our final answer to the second integral. All right, for this third question here, this may seem a little bit intimidating, but just follow the process. We're going to define u and dv, and the order we choose u is remembered by Liate, and i stands for inverse trig functions, and tangent inverse of x is an inverse trig function, so that's going to be our u term. Our u term is going to be tangent inverse of x, and sometimes uh, people will call this arctangent of x if you don't recognize this, but we're also going to define dv, and in this case, the only thing left over is dx. And then we're going to calculate du is equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. And we're going to tack on this dx. And then here, v, the antiderivative of dx is just x. All right, Because it's kind of like just saying, what's the antiderivative of 1, which is just x. So now uh, steps 1 and 2 are done. And we're going to use integration by parts. So now we're going to say this is equal to u times v. So we have x tangent inverse of x minus the integral of v times du, which is going to give us x over 1 plus x squared dx. So we're just multiplying x times this fraction and tacking on the dx. So then here, now notice this new integral, we have to do a u substitution. Okay, so for this new integral, we're going to let u, and you know what, maybe I should pick a different letter because we already used u for this. So that's kind of sloppy if we do that as our math. So we could use, let's say, the letter q. So q is equal to 1 plus x squared. So then dq is going to be equal to 2x times dx. So if we solve for dx, solving for dx gives us dq over 2x equals dx. So then here, what we're going to do is, for our answer, we have x tangent inverse x. That part doesn't change. But now we have minus the integral of, and we have x over u, and then dx is equal to, I'm sorry, not u. Once again, we're using the letter q. So you have x over q times dx is dq over 2x. And now the x's cancel out, which should happen when you make a u substitution, or in this case, a q substitution. So then for our next line here, we have x tangent inverse x minus, and this 2 in the denominator could come out as a 1 half. We have 1 half the integral of dq over q. So then the last thing we have to do here is just evaluate. So we have x tangent inverse x minus 1 half natural log absolute value of q and then plus c at the end. And now we just have to substitute everything back in. So we have x tangent inverse of x minus 1 half natural log absolute value of 1 plus x squared and then plus c. If we stop here, this is a little bit sloppy because the absolute value of 1 plus x squared is just 1 plus x squared because this is always positive. Any number you plug in for x, it doesn't matter. 1 plus x squared is always a positive number, which tells us that we could just get rid of the absolute value. So you have minus 1 half natural log, now parentheses, 1 plus x squared, and then plus c. So this is our solution to the third example here. Okay, for the last example here, this question has potential to be a true nightmare because remember, we have to repeat this process until we're done. And if there's an x to the third in front, we're going to have to do integration by parts more than two times here in order to get to the end. And that could be very, very exhausting. So there is a pretty nice shortcut to these questions of this specific type. So what we do is our u term is going to be x to the third power. But what's going to be different is we can make kind of like a little table here. So we're going to have x to the third power in the first row because this is our u term. And then we're going to have e to the x over 3 in our next row. And then in the third row, well, we'll see what that's going to be in a moment. Or I'm sorry, the third column. And then what you do is you just take the derivative all the way down until there's nothing left. So we have 3x squared would be our next derivative. Then we're going to have 6 times x. And then we're going to have 6. 
All right, now I could go to the next line, which is zero, but we don't have to do that here. And then in this one, this row, it's gonna be a little bit trickier, but we would do the antiderivative of e to the x over three. And the antiderivative of e to the x over three is e to the x over three, and then divided by the derivative of x over three, which is one third, so dividing by one third gives us a coefficient of three. But on the side, if you wanna do a little u sub here, you'll see that this is in fact the antiderivative of e to the x over three. But then the pattern is that each new antiderivative just gets multiplied by three. So the next one's gonna be nine e to the x over three. And then the last one here is gonna be 27 e to the x over three. This has been called the tic-tac-toe method in the past, but the way that it works is the signs alternate. So it starts off here, we're gonna write a plus, minus, plus, minus, and I have to go one more row down here. For the antiderivative, I'm gonna need another one. So the next line here, times three again, would be 81e to the x over three, because once again, the derivative of six is just zero. So we're gonna need to go down to the fourth row here. And remember, these just alternate, plus, minus, plus, minus. So then how does this little algorithm work here? Well, now when we want to take the antiderivative, we're going to multiply this term here, like on a downward diagonal, like going like in the southeast direction. We're going to multiply 3x to the third, e to the x over 3. So we're just multiplying these terms here together. And then when we look across, plus tells us to keep the sign the same. So this was positive, we're going to keep it positive. But now for the next term, we're multiplying 3x squared times 9e to the x over 3, and we're going to get 27x squared e to the x over 3. However, that minus sign tells us in this row to change the sign. So instead of a positive 27, we're going to have a minus 27 in front. So now we just continue this process. We're multiplying 6x times 27e to the x over 3, and we, when we multiply these two together, we're going to get 162 x e to the x over 3. And the plus sign in this row tells us that we're going to keep the sign the same. So now this is going to be a plus 162. And then now for the last one, we have 6 times 81 e to the x over 3. And when we multiply those two, we're going to get minus 486 e to the x over 3. And the reason why it's a minus here is because there's a minus in this row. So the, like this was once positive 486 e to the x over 3, but that minus tells us to change the sign. And now we just throw on our plus c. All right, and you see this process is way, way faster than if we were to define u and dv all the way down, but this is reserved for just a few examples where you have really high powers of x in front and you don't feel like doing this process more than once. And if we want to simplify our answer a bit, we could factor out an e to the, I'm sorry, a 3e to the x over 3 and the first term will be left with x to the third. And for the next term, we'd be left with minus 9x squared. For the third term here, we would be left with plus 54x. And for the last term here, we'd be left with minus 162. Close the parentheses, and we got our plus c at the end. And this is our final answer to the fourth question. Okay, well, this is going to conclude this video on integration by parts. If you found this video to be helpful, please click the like and subscribe buttons. It really helps me grow the channel. And if you got any requests, topics you want me to cover, just leave them in the comment section below. And thank you for watching.